computer is. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Greyhorn Pagans podcast. I am here again for the third time now. Nah, third time, bro. We did uh, we did two giants, but uh, and this time we're going a lot smaller again. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Joshua Fortini. Ro, you have dug up some stuff again. Um, like I said, we went from giants. We're going to go to something very much smaller than that. So, what do you got for us this time? Stein, I found the coolest thing. It's called the Havener Runestone in Oklahoma. All right. Now, there's a lot of reasons they're dating this thing at about 1,500 years old. They're putting it right around five to 600 AD. Um, the, first of all, the age of it, the carving, the whole nine yards, you know, the, the stuff in the area, the legends that go back, you know, from the Native American folk and everybody stating that this thing has been here for quite some time. Um, this is... This is significant when you think about the fact that no European people were said to have been in the Americas around 500 AD. It wasn't even until around 1000 AD, 1100, that um, um, Eric the Red, uh, yeah, Eric the Red Sun, Leif Erikson, yeah, that made was, it. That was him. So, I mean, this is five, six hundred years before Leif Erikson. All right. Hmm. And the alphabet that they're using on it actually correctly puts it in that time frame because they were switching from the older food arc to the younger food arc where they're actually removing letters from the alphabet and making um, syllabic combinations with a single letter. So it, it kind of shortened the alphabet, but it also shortened the dialect a little. And there was a lot of speculation as to why, but this rune stone you can tell was from that time frame because of such. So, um, they had some some of the elder food arc letters, but like the the end rune they used was younger food arc, and you mm -hmm. know a couple little. Different. Um, I don't know if you have a piece of that you can bring up, anyways. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. I should be able to i should be able to all right uh let's see share a screen just a portion of the screen yes that is all right let's see let's try and elongate that get it right so now it, this is the one you're talking about that is it you see all the way on the left hand side we have the gibo mm -hmm. um this is this is our g now, the, the odd thing is that second letter, right? Because it doesn't fit the Elder Futhark exactly. Our Nalthese is a little different. Yeah. You know, the line goes all the way through it. So there, there's speculation on that, but it puts it right, if you put it right in between the transition from the Elder to the Younger Futhark, which they put it right in that time frame mm -hmm. uh, historically. So, I mean, it fits. It says Gnome Doll, right? G N O M D A L. All right. Yeah. Gnome Dale. Right. The Dale of the Gnomes. Now, a lot of Dales. You know, yeah. 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 The farmer in the Dell, you know, the, the, the rolling hills. Mm -hmm. So they have an area that from the 1500s when we got here, there was already legends. Don't go there. Right. These legends started, you know, what they didn't know at the time, but almost a thousand years before the Native Americans knew, don't go to that place, right? There's Native American lore telling that when they were dragged from the, um, when they were dragged from their lands in Florida and whatnot and put in the reservations in Oklahoma, that was one of the areas that they tried to shove them in and they found out quickly that they did not like that spot. So there was a whole chunk of their reservation that the, the people didn't want to use because they had warnings to stay away from it. So they tried to put the Indians there. The Indians didn't want to use it. So they have this empty valley for, you know, a couple hundred years that just, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, 
you know, uh, we, we basically stayed away from it. Well, we started our state park system and, you know, we try to <laughs> figure out what's going on. And uh, of course, the, the state park pops up. They put a fence around it. Nobody can see it, touch it, get near it. And uh, I guess it's gotten a little more slack as of late. You know, nowadays you can actually get up near it and take pictures of it and whatnot. But uh, for the, through the 60s and 70s, when during the founding of that state parks and all of that stuff, it was uh, fenced off literally like a couple feet from it. You couldn't touch it. You couldn't get near it or anything. Hmm. So it was, uh, it was impossible to, to do anything to do any work on it, to date it, to do anything other than just, you know, check the area around it. But there's uh, a lot of lore now. Oklahoma specifically has a lot of lore. Now they have everything from Bigfoot to the the, the little people that yeah. they warned about in Gnome Doll. You know, um, there's a couple Native American tales, but you look and that's in Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. Now you look on both sides of the country. And you have similar things happening. You have another group that is experiencing the moon-eyed people. At the same time, another group of Indians is, a, is meeting the ant people. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and they have a lore that spreads back from that. Let's get into the ant people. Okay. Right? The Hopi. The ant people are a kind of Western United States thing. Um, there, there are a few tribal tales further over in the U.S., but... Basically, the, the Western tribes and the Central American tribes, they, they have a, a lore about these people that came to them before a great disaster called the Ant People. They came out of the ground, out of the mountains, out of the mesas, and got the name. And they even depict them in their cave yeah. paintings and whatnot with um, antenna, oh. right? And they have them next to humans. And in some of them, they're like way bigger than the people. and other ones, they're way smaller than the people. And they so, had these hills that they could actually put their head against the stone and travel into these little holes, right? Yeah, mm. really cool legend. But these people came to them before a disaster and basically told them there's going to be a, a terrible winter coming that's going to be kind of long. You're going to need a really long store of food for this one. Three times, four times more than any winter you've ever prepared for. And they taught them how to do different things in a, a generational period, like um, farming turkeys and using their eggs for protein while oh, storing yeah. the turkey out of the meat and storing it. And there were so many uses. Um, they, the, they quite literally changed their lifestyle, started building homes in the side of mesas up off the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And started storing... Um, buffalo chips to burn wood to burn things to cook with um they were drying foods at that time drying corn um jerking meat doing anything they could to preserve food salt packing they yeah. learned all of the time frame from the ant people now we know that right about five six hundred we had something happen we like to call the dark ages yeah. right Right about the same time the Gnome Doll runestone is, right? The Dark Ages happen, and we have at least an 18-month winter. Some people's interpretation would say it was a three-year winter. Let's, let's call it an 18-month winter, a year and a half, okay. right? They would have had to have stored three times the amount of food. They would have had to have stored, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's a long period of time to prep for, so they had to change their whole lifestyle, and they yeah. had to do it rapidly. Something we no. talked about on the uh, the Ragnarok podcast as well, um, mm -hmm. just the uh, the long winter and how the uh, but an eighteen month winter, dude, that's that's brutal. That that's almost impossible to comprehend. Think about if that happened now. Oh, what would dude. we do? I mean, that's that's a dark thought. All of a sudden, we have no farming for eighteen months. Yeah. Yeah, there would be really no way. I mean, that, yeah, like we have that. we have indoor farming now, and uh, you know, glass houses and and all of that. But 
but it'd still be a struggle and you uh, wow. you would have to do so many things artificially and like your um energy bills just fucking shooting up and everything freezing that'd be tough even nowadays even with the the technologies and farming technologies that we have developed over the uh, over the centuries look at texas last winter oh First yeah one, was it they had blackouts their windmills froze they had no power yeah they, people were desperate fast and i mean it happened over a couple day period where it went from okay to no way you know like people literally like looting stores looking yeah. for food that's it's already gone. People bought it. You know, they're I mean, breaking in stores for no reason in, in most of the occasions. Yeah, we have, <laughs> no. we have harsh winters here in um, in Europe, in northern Europe, here in the Netherlands. But you know, I can't imagine just like no no power, whatever. I mean, a couple of years ago, um, my my heater broke. So like in the dead of winter, it was like December, January, whatever. I had no central heating at home and there was just like no central heating i i you know i could like burn the stove and whatever but yeah like how many heat will uh will that provide so right man that was now, I that was it. rough like i can't imagine that for 18 months in a row without right. the luxuries that we have now now think about this i live in florida bro a lot of the houses down here don't have heaters on them no, why would you <laughs> have a, 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 like literally they'll have a window unit in one of the windows of an old concrete house that never had ducts put in it for central heat and air. Mm -hmm. So they're essentially cooling their house with one little window unit air conditioner or cooling one portion of their house or they'll put a couple of them in different windows. But like they have no heat. They're bringing space heaters in. That takes electricity. If your grid goes down, you're screwed. You know what I mean? Even with a generator, a heater takes a lot of the power of a generator. Yeah. You know what I mean? And a lot of the smaller generators or normal sized household generators won't handle a couple of heaters running. They might handle one, maybe two smaller ones, but they're not going to handle enough to heat every room of the house. So you'd almost, so, have, I mean, to, like, you'd almost have to get a, a generator per and, heater. And now that's in modern times. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now imagine this happening imagine this happening when you're still living on the ground in in skin huts wigwams teepees you know what i mean uh, now there were adobe houses but like at, at that time frame they weren't they weren't uh there was no sign of them building them but they did at that point right at about that time frame start building these houses up on the cliff sites that right? would help that's very isolated yeah. like isolated insulated this. think about this if you're up there with your food, you have all your fire materials and enough food to last mm -hmm. for the whole time. The only thing you have to ward against is birds and things that can climb really high up a cliff wall. Right? That's not too bad. All right. Now, you've got what? Your whole tribe up there. Somebody's going to throw a couple ladders up. You push them back down. Somebody drops a rope ladder down, you reach up, you cut it, and you drop them. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're basically up on a cliff wall. Once you pull your ladders up, you're secure. And they had 20, 30-foot ladders. They'd climb up to a certain level, and they'd pull their ladders up, right? Now, mm -hmm. you can go look at Mesa Verde to this day. If they don't have ladders down there, you're not getting up to it. So we know they were secure for a long winter with their food, and yeah. they're still here. Their tribe survived the Dark Ages. So we know that they existed through it. Their tails came with them. You know what I mean? We, we have to validate that, right? Now, on the other side of the country, simultaneously, we have the moon-eyed people. Similar situation, people come out of caves. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, they can only come out at night because they can't see during the day. Their eyes are extremely sensitive to sunlight. Mm. Um, they were said to be very pale skin, fair haired, blue or gray eyed, you know, and they they were blinded by sunlight, even some phases of the moon. And some of the tales, it would tell they couldn't come out during certain phases of the moon. I mean, I can, they were... I can imagine if you live like literally in a cave or underground or in the side of a mountain, 
it gets really dark there. So like the, the only light you have is either that little bit of natural light that's coming in or like torches or fire or whatever. So yeah, the sun that would like basically practically instantly blind you. Right. Okay. Now think about this. Our ancestors were walking around with candles and oil lamps at night. They didn't have these, you know, thousand candle powered flashlights on the back of their cell phones and, you know, little handheld flashlights that are putting out, you know, 5,000 lumens with two AA batteries. Oh, let's see, I have one. They yeah. were something like this, you know, this is, and this is just the basic, basic thing. Right. Now I, I can reach down to my backpack and I, you oh, know what I mean? I got my yeah. light. That's a good one. Our ancestors, they're walking around with candles, right? At night, their eyes were a lot more sensitive just back then, period, without electric light, yeah. their eyes were a lot more sensitive. Now, like you look at nowadays, we can't see half the stars in the sky with around the cities because of all the light pollution. Light pollution, right? yeah. I, that's like even in my neighborhood, um, a lot of uh, a lot of apartments blocks. So like, uh, just there's not really um, a lot of light coming off. You know, it's not beaming off, but like everyone at their front door has their own has their own light. So if it's a, a huge apartment block, let's say, I don't know, fucking 20 in a row and five stories high, that's that's a couple hundred a lot that's of a couple hundred lights. And that's just, you know, the one at the front door. So you can see where to, you know, put right. your put your key in, let alone everything that's like shining through from the windows or the street lights now, even. You've been to Petra. Yeah. You've been to Petra. Tell me the night sky is not completely different. Oh dude, I slept in the desert with the uh, with the bedouin um it's it's amazing it's beautiful like you you could see the milky way and uh, yeah that's that's how you know you're now, you're, you're a city think folk. about this like, our ancestors now there's there's our disconnect number one from our ancestors right they had that view of the sky. They based their calendar around it. Yeah. They had yeah. constellations that they they admired and and they talked to, you know, the, the guardians, everything that they did was based around an astrological calendar for, you know, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So that that disconnect from electric light, dude, that that cut us off from the stars, man. I mean, that ain't think about that. There's our there's our first disconnect from humankind is to what our ancestors lived through. You yeah. know what I mean? Why are yeah. we not as close to our gods as they were? Well, I mean, we, because, we're cutting ourselves yeah. away with luxury. Because we quite literally can see them. Literally. Okay. Now, these people come out of the caves. Their eyes are so sensitive. I mean, just imagine that. Generations of people through a cave. You know, they mm -hmm. may have been in there since the, the younger Dryas living in those caves like that right and just think about the concept of that alone you have a group of people coming out of a cave they basically had a small bonding period with the native americans they had a couple of relationships with a few different little tribes where they were helpful but then these wars broke out mm -hmm. and basically the few of them that weren't integrated into certain tribes were wiped out <laughs> now there are still tribes that claim to have descendants of the moon eyed people and they do not look like the normal tribe members they have blue eyes they look almost al albino though like they might have uh some of them may have albino gene now was that created from years and years and years of being in a cave you know what i mean generation after generation after generation of it because well, our ancestors if it's at some point during the ice ages did i mean if it's genetic then um i mean it may look like albi they may look like albinos but if it's you know if they have some uh genetics left from the moon eyed people it's it's definitely genetics but that makes me wonder you know who were those moon eyed people why were they they living in those caves i mean that that really like first thing that yeah. comes in comes to my mind is the uh, the hollow earth theory even we have to take into consider well i mean the un underneath the united states brother the mammoth cave system there oh. you could literally go in and like 
Tennessee and come out over by California, right? Now, it's not going to be a pleasant journey and you're going to be squeezing through like snail <laughs> holes. So, but, I mean, th- if you want to do some ultimate spelunking, dude, this is the place, right? All over but, the world, there are like, tunnel systems going underneath cities and, and whole countries. And like some, some are more say, modern and man-made and others... Let's say it's just a simpler explanation, though, right? Let's let's say it's not that deep. Let's say it's just something as simple as during the Younger Dryas, they adapted to cave life. They found safety there. You know what I mean? They found warmth in the cold there. They they figured out how to bar off a place in the back of the cave, and they had their their spot. No, they weren't messed with because the Native Americans didn't really travel into the caves they don't know if there's a bear or a wild cat or whatever you know what yeah. i mean caves were caves have always been spooky you know what i mean and, and yeah it doesn't if you've matter. ever approached a large cave there's a different vibe around them you know what i mean yeah you, you it's, get a different it's, feeling it's, it's big it's dark it's damp it's unpleasant there's so much rock over your head that if the earth shakes just a little you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you oh. have that thought in your head constantly when you're in a cave. If the earth shakes just a touch, I am so screwed right now. Yeah. But either you're like nuts, either you're not getting out or you're, you know, you're crushed. I mean, like both ways you're not getting out. But now let's say it's just that simple. During one of the last ice ages, they spent a couple of generations in there. They adapted to it. Sometime throughout, then the Native American peoples came. And these people, well, I mean, they only come out at night, but when they travel around at night, they see the campfires, they see their villages, they probably see them. And think about this, they can see at night really, really well. So the Native Americans, even as skilled of hunters and trackers as they were being out at night, they would have never been able to see these people because they lived and survived on hiding. Right. Yeah. And they can see them, literally see them coming in the dark from a mile away. So, I mean, it changes it all together. And think about how sensitive your smell would be in a cave, too, man. When you come out and hit everything, like the smell of oh. other people. Yeah. Dude, it, like, they would be easily detectable and easily avoidable. So, until they wanted to be seen, they, I don't think they really were. You know what I mean? And the dark ages were coming about and something happened where they knew it was time for them to come out of the caves. And these alliances started happening with some of the Indian tribes and the moon eyed people. Right. Now, some of the moon eyed people are also described as only being about two and a half to three feet tall. Right. Some of them larger, four or five foot, but a lot of them full grown, three, four feet. You know what I mean? That's they're, they're depicted tiny. as being smaller. Yeah, the, the stone effigies of them are are small, you know, and they they are uh, the mysterious tales, dude. They really are, but because we we're only dealing with like the the verbal lore on it. Mm-hmm. But we do have the effigies that are, date back to you know when they say the, these people came out. They're five, six, seven hundred years old or older, and I mean that. That says that somebody remembered the tales long enough to see to still see them and carve it out. You know what I mean? So we know it's older than 700 years, but don't know if it goes all the way back to the Dark Ages. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I think I have may I may have found a um, a picture of um, what you meant by uh, Native Americans with the uh, the Moon Eye people genetics and how it really uh, resembles albinism um let's see share screen just a portion yeah something like this are they part of their charities correct uh this is i uh this is what google brave uh of google brave um brave images uh i i looked up my uh moon eyed people and this is one of the things that um that popped up and it it really yeah i mean if this now they look like albinos definitely now, the, the lore, the spoken tales, the stone effigies, the carvings in the caves, the paintings in the caves, it came from somewhere. You know what I mean? Now, you go right around the corner, and you have these things that were found. That This is literally the next thing I was going to ask you if you could find. 
the yeah. stone effigy of the Moonite people, right? You notice how they made their faces very flat. Yeah, very, very round and very flat. Narrow, long noses, mm -hmm. large eyes, but small. I mean, yeah. if they had stones that were big enough, they could have carved one that was actual size. Sure. But they they, they carved them about three and a half feet tall. Hmm. So I'm just saying, I, I think there's there's a lot more little people legends than a lot of people connect. You know what I mean? Because it, it's cross-cultural. You know what I mean? Yeah. Started with Germanic tales, then into Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Holland spread in the vedic tales um there is a cemetery that was found in coffee county tennessee did i do you have a slide of that that i sent you um, that one i want to talk about because this one is mind-blowing you did send me something a pygmy tribe in ancient tennessee yes i okay let's That's open it. the open the link i'll just um i'll share full screen for this one share just screen. gonna give you uh, an, an out there question where do you think the tales of the moon eyed people in the united states happen right in that ballpark i mean eastern ten eastern united states right around tennessee virginia this that, is that whole this is oh, definitely a burial mound. This is right. a this is a classic burial mound. Now here's here's the thing. They find seventy five to a hundred thousand skeletons at around three feet tall and smaller that are adult. Their sacral suture on the top of their head is fully fused. They are grown to adulthood. And yeah. three feet tall. If people are living in caves, they don't need or want to be big. They want to run on as little nutrition as possible, as little room as possible. So it would say that it would stand to say that, like, generationally, they would get smaller after being in caves for some time. Right. Yeah. Well, this guy's farm, he's, I guess, renovating some land and runs across. 18 inch long, 12 inch broad, the little bones piece apart. One of the second two. grave was like two feet long, one inch wide. What two foot long, one inch wide, 50 inches deep. Bones, teeth, teeth vessels, shell. shells. So, definitely, definitely a burial site. Now, it, but if, if you keep reading through there, it's in other journals too, scientific journals that they found this graveyard. There's no other way. It's like a mass grave, but there's seventy-five to a hundred thousand skeletons there. Jeez. Now, even in our times, our graveyards aren't that big, dude. No, we've got a lot of cemeteries around, but how many of them can boast that many graves? I mean, Paris catacombs that's about the only one i can think of that that's insane yeah and even so apparently even the the bones were stronger than like yeah, your your average average human bone i mean if you if you live like in a cave and like your your ground and your walls and all of that is rocks then yeah Elbows, the eyes knee, and ankle and joints. Were taller. Yeah, and even like the elbows, knees, and ankle joints. So the almost like they were walking hunched over constantly. Huh. You you see how Smeagol walks? Now yeah. imagine if your your ankles were always cocked like that, and you were walking around in a short area, like people that were living in caves. Tennessee is littered with caves, dude. And it it stands to reason. I mean, this, this is not the first piece of evidence that we have that North America is a graveyard of something beyond what they're letting us know, right? Yeah. Because this is, the information is there, but it's not common knowledge. 
How many people know that there is a mass grave of 75,000 small people in Tennessee? 75,000. That's, that, that's, I mean, for Precisely. like for here, here in the Netherlands, that would be a, a decent sized town. Now, <laughs> how many residents were in that village? And let, let's say it did, let's say they were burying them all in that same spot over a hundred year period, right? And still they were burying a thousand. thousand. Yo. They're, they're, they're burying 75 to 100 people a year over a hundred year span. That's insane. No, that's that's too much. I mean, like, you, you think about the have population to. of that. Yeah. But, think about the population of them, though. Like, how big their populace had to be in order to sustain a build a graveyard that size. Or just, you know, time way further back because that's that's too much in in a too short time span like if you bury that amount of well people let's say they're people a year dude like in in 10 years there'd be nobody left to bury right and there would be nobody left to bury you right now they're burying a hundred people a year over a hundred year span now th there's there's no big village that they found, right? There's no there's no showing of a huge civilization, which is the weird part. Seventy five thousand. I mean, think about that. Just in that very amount. That, that was a big populace of people. Where was their population? Where was their city? Where were they all? I mean, were they in the caves? Were all of them in a cave system? That's insane to even think about, you know? So, like... I know, cave imagine systems. Seeing, imagine seeing, a, let's say, a three-foot-tall person as you're out hunting one day, and you're trying to tell your friends, no, dude, listen, I saw one of these things. And they're like, dude, shut up. You know what I mean? Like... Nobody would believe if you if you told them, you know, I was hunting out in the woods in Tennessee and like four of these little three foot tall dudes ran out and skewered a rabbit, and ran back in the cave. Like you'd be called a lunatic. <laughs> right? Yeah. People people I think mean, you hit your head or whatever. Like, you know, just I don't know. Like what's in those woods? Right. What what kind of what kind of shrooms did you take? Uh, now you can't tell me that that like that stuff is impossible because I mean, the bones are there. Yeah. You know, now here's another great uh, little tidbit of information. You know who got those bones? Oh God, let me One guess. guess. Smithsonian. One guess. Yeah. Oh, uh, for real. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. 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 Bits and pieces of them. There are some of them mm -hmm. that are safe in other areas, but that's about the gist of it. You know what I mean? Like, oh God. okay. You'll find little pieces in the museum here, little pieces in the museum there, right? Um, pop this one up. Dude. This one's really cool. Look, uh, search San Pedro Mountains, Wyoming, Priory Mountain, the Crow Indians. They had a tale of little I, people. I do have a picture here also of the um one of the cave paintings of the the ant people dude that looks freaky right let me just let me share so that other people may see it too um this i'm just a now just a bit like, let me tell you a, here let this, me tell you a little this story is, dude this is weird this looks so right look at the Hornstein. Look at the horns. When yeah. they, they, they put the ant people headdresses on, I'm just saying, think about this. But, if somebody's but, in a cave, right, everything they're doing is done in low light. Everything is tactile, right? Yeah. Would they want to do something to their hair to keep them from bumping their heads or wear something that had like a, a, a warning system on it or maybe even develop antennas to keep you from smacking your heads into something i would say like actually develop right. them because you know just just to wear something that's not practical that now 
the Hopi, you get into more of those pictures of those cave paintings. And as I was looking for more of them, I ran across this tale of um, this guy finding a whole bunch of these ant people um, cave paintings. And he's in there excavating and he's working in the cave. And this other group comes in and says well, that they're taking the dig over, right? So he hurries up, he takes a couple pictures. Mm. You know what I mean? He makes a couple sketches, takes his notes and gets out, right? They go about with the dig. He didn't realize who it was. It was the Smithsonian. He comes nice. back a couple of days later to try to come back and get some more drawings of them. Dude, and this is so elaborate. Right. Now, see the waves, like almost like sound waves or a doorway coming off of their hand? Sound waves, yeah. Or just ripples. A doorway, a sound ripples. Stone. All right. Now, now just look at that as like it's a doorway in the stone. Like if you were looking into a hole bored in the stone. Mm -hmm. Right. And that person standing next to it. And they, they told tales that they would literally go into these little holes in the stone. Oh, yeah, man. Like, let's see. This is the this is the best one. This is the clearest one. But yeah, those are definitely. That's not horns. Those are, those are antennas. Antenna, something. It's. I mean, I know what horns to... look like. I like even the Native Americans. They know what horns look like. They have. They there were and still are horned animals running around. You know, it's not. They would have just depicted bullhorns, not this. Like, look at the ant, ant mandibles, right? Or an ant's antenna. They're they're almost variegated. They have little sections on them, right? Yeah, just like those horns, like the little nodules on them and stuff. That's it. It's crazy. Now this guy comes back because he wants to get some more of his evidence, and literally catches these Smithsonian dudes with acetone wiping away some of the Hopi cave paintings. Ah, uh, of course. Well, right now he he got documentation of them and stuff. So, I mean, he, he had a little bit of proof, but beyond that, some of them were wiped away. Now, how many times has that happened? That's just yeah, the too ones many. That just they, too many. Right. Now, little people, dude, we've got them from one side of the United States to the other. Right? And I mean, like, it, it's, it's not a thing that's only in the United States. Um, in Priory Mountain, that's what I was telling you earlier. Uh, San Pedro Mountains, Wyoming, Priory Mountain. They found okay. Pedro the Mummy. Pedro Just, the Mummy? Yeah. Search um, <laughs> okay. Priory okay. Mountain, Pedro the Mummy. Let's see. Pedro the Mountain Mummy. Oh. Whoa. Okay. I think this will... This is a great comparison picture. Let me see. Yeah. Wow. Okay. This people, this this you gotta see, man. Like with just an actual dude, let's say grown man, I don't know, six feet. Yeah, yeah. Let's call him five ten for conservative purposes, five nine, whatever, average sure. guy. Sure. He's He's holding something that would stand upright at just about two and a half feet. If that. Mm -hmm. If that. Because now, let's see, I did find pictures of just the mummy. Yeah. Wow, that's. Now, Pedro is an adult. Is, that is very human-like indeed just you know look at the this is like a regular hand with fingers and developed like an adult though not a child yeah all right nose eyes now... mouth lips everything everything's there we know these tales didn't originate in the united states right but what did happen when the United States was formed? 
and the, the got established the Smithsonian and Rockefellers take over and it becomes fairy tales and bedtime stories and yeah. legends that yeah. I, bringing bringing that over feel. bringing that over from Europe because like here in Europe the disconnect was like of course already happening so like if you go to a new country a new continent even it's i mean you're you're literally starting over so you can just you can tell the people anything they want you know and, uh, like a couple generations down the line people will have forgotten you know what europe was or the stories there or whatever they would have forgotten it or it would have been so um like retold rewritten as to indeed fit a certain narrative right oh this tribe of the gray horn pagans podcast is brought to you by starbucks coffee not really but oh I man just look dude if only it was i could quit my job <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> might be able to pay the rent without working every day mm. yeah i'm wearing my uh <laughs> My seven day week t-shirt getting rough, brother. Wearing my t-shirt from work though, thought that was uh, appropriate. Right so, oh man, if only <laughs> if only we could get to uh, <laughs> if only we could get them to sponsor us. Like I, I'm I'm not gonna drink their coffee, but still, I'll I'll take the money. That's that's fine, dude. I'd be happy with nice brand Icelandic water. You know, like just give us something. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, man. I mean, I I started the Patreon. For the for the Greyhorn podcast, so you know if if you're listening, if you're watching, and you're like, you know, I these seem like like cool guys. The tribe seems like a like a cool tribe. I I'd love to support them. You know, go to Patreon slash Greyhorn Pagans, support us. Subscribe, we have a couple of tiers. Like Patreon, oh, just, <laughs> just every everything you know, help us, help you, help us. We need a reservation, man, to hide from these crazy people. We just want to live a country life. <laughs> let us be. Uh, we Give need us to... some pigs and some chickens and 10 acres and let us go, dog. We're good. We don't want to get wiped by the Smithsonian. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, think about that. Sign, like, right at about that same time frame that we start developing our country. Abraham Lincoln comes out and starts talking about giant skeletons and all yeah. that. Smithsonian is, in the meantime, trying to wipe it all out. They're trying to cover this all up. Why? Like, it's so depressing to even, like, to, what, what, you can't think of a reasonable motive to disconnect us from the history. Like, I mean. Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, I mean, a disconnected people are a easily controllable people. And, you know, if control and, and money and power is what you're about. Yeah. Then if people yeah, know, yeah. if people know the truth. They're never going to let you do those things. They're never, never going to, you know, give you the power, even, you know, like with every bit of trickery and magic that, you know, see if you can find that, um, see if you can find that search that on brave, the guy wiping away the Hopi cave paintings, dude, um, Mm. just search, uh, Smithsonian archeologist caught destroying cave painting. I'm I'm 99% sure it'll be in the top searches but destroying cave paintings oh god i really need need keely to do all this behind the scenes stuff that will be so much easier uh uh, uh, uh. you heard that keely behind the scenes we need somebody Oh uh, yeah, of course. Like I, I can find articles about climate change destroying cave art and all that stuff. That's I'm not finding much, but keep talking. I'll uh, I'll keep searching. I'll. Uh, anyways, we'll uh, we'll we'll see it in just a minute. Trust me, you'll find it because it's not that hard to find. You search it a couple different ways, but. Article from Gaia. This, oh, of course, fact, fact checked by Snopes. The Smithsonian has literally been responsible for wiping away a significant portion of these finds that, like, you can audit where are they now. And I mean, the closest 
that anybody can find is a couple of reports of people saying the Smithsonian had to dump stuff in the Atlantic Ocean. You know, like, where is it now? That's what the, the, the real questions need to start getting asked. Like, all of these things were found and it was logged that the Smithsonian accepted them. Then what? And then, you know, it, it, it's it's becoming a dark part of our history. Unfortunately, yeah. And I don't do you even, have that? I don't even know what's going if you on. If you want to change era. history, do you actually have to time travel? No. No, you just think about it. You just you know, like you literally just have to destroy history and you know keep denying, 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 denying. At a certain point, people will just stop asking because you know they're not going to get an answer. They're not going to get a straight answer, or they're got or five generations later they just forget. Yeah, or just you know, gonna get one of those those politician answers that they answer your question, but that answer only brings up more questions. You know, like right. they they t they it's it's a word salad, but you don't have an answer. Well, the, it's scary when you look at what they're asking us to do now, to downsize our farms, to give up these nitrogen fertilizers that we've been using for years and years and years. Sell our livestock. <laughs> we strip soil. We stripped the biome level of the soil down to nothing. That if we had to give up those fertilizers now, dude, you know how many people are going to die in the transition? Oh, it's so going to be much. insane. So You're much. Six, six to seven hundred million dead in the first four months. Okay, I can Here find it. more on Google about it's it. Luckily, I'm working with a VPN. I can how bad you like, it's it's even happening in in Australia in Tasmania where um I mean this is coming from the Smithsonian magazine website so you know take it as you will um but in Tasmania like so called or what they like to call vandals um destroying um Australia's aboriginal people like uh, cave paintings and cave handprints and um, like several thousands years old like it's happening all over the world have i ever showed you the history circle the the vanderbilts in the smithsonian if you go search the vanderbilts online and you look most of the articles will be by the smithsonian right if you go oh. search the history of the Smithson family or the Smithsonian online, most of the articles will be by Vanderbilt EDU. Huh. Vanderbilt College. It's crazy, dude. Like they're writing their own histories. Yeah, but still, I think families like the uh like the Vanderbilts um and, and the Rockefellers, etc. I mean, they are what you or what we would call nowadays industry plants, because I don't, they they are working, they are still working for someone. They are still taking orders from someone or, or some institution. And in return, they're getting all that money. They're getting all that power. They're getting the beautiful uh, Gilded Age mansions. My God, those things are huge and they're gorgeous. But they're erasing history. Yeah. Now, I mean, all right, the Native American. Um, I, I know you're having a hard time finding that right now. This is why we do need Gilly behind the scenes working with us. But yeah. uh, the other slide I sent you on Telegram, the Native American uh, Legends of Little People. I think it was one of the last ones I sent you. Maybe the one before that. Pop uh, that one up. The mysterious... A mysterious yeah, I wonder... universe. Yeah. Uh, let's set it in. Uh... Oh, I can only view it in light mode if I have a subscription. Okay, that's fine. Let's see. Let's share the screen again. Let's do the, the whole screen this time. Okay. Now, roll through this a bit. Uh, one of the prominent Native American stories. Dwarves, fairies, trolls, imps. Yeah, that's and that's all. That's basically all your Euro, all European. 
from uh, from what we know. All right. Now, um, right there, that, that Arizona, second paragraph. Right. One of the read that second. That's it, right there. Highlight that second paragraph. Let's see. Oh, just this one. So, all right. One of the prominent Native American stories of little people comes from the wilds of Arizona, from the, pardon my pronunciation, Yavapai, which literally means people of the sun, so we comprised have... of four different tribes oh. that inhabited the area of Arizona, right? Now, people of the sun, um, to you, that's all I'm going to say, to you, Twisco, um, the tribes of Tyr. They carry down. Anyways, um, we'll get into that in another podcast. Um, sure. Sounds good. Bordered by the San Francisco peaks of the north and the Pinella Mountains and as it's all mountains to the southeast, the Colorado River to the west and the Gila River and Salt to the south. Among the lore, the Yagapai is believed that the land was once and still perhaps is inhabited by a race of little people they call the Kakaka, Kokaka, something like that. Kokoka. Described now that they oh. remind me of brownies. Right? Being Think only of the tales of the brownies and sprites. Only a foot in height. That's for right. for us Europeans. That's thirty to thirty three centimeters. That's like your average school no. ruler, dude. That's like twenty two centimeters. No, 26 centimeters. Okay, so let's say, yeah, let's say somewhere between 26 and 31, 32. Perfectly round heads with no nose, as we have, as we just saw on the... Um, Pedro. On the carvings. And on the carvings. They yeah. basically had no nose or just, you know, very elongated, very flat, which, I mean, you could say, like, they have no nose. Now, you see... You've seen Pedro's face, right? Yeah. Like the moon-eyed, flat face, wide set eyes, narrow nose, long, narrow nose. So they are just right? just like Indians, but little tiny Indians. So they were people just very, very short. Like brownies. And only talking to the I'm teacher, the leader. Name. Oh, wow. So they only really spoke to the uh, the important, elders. powerful, the, the elders of the tribe, indeed. Yes. They never die? Whoa, okay. They are around all the time. You can see them all the time, but it can ha happen sometimes. But quick like that, and you can see them no more. They are just like the wind, like air. Wow, okay. All right, now. You want to hear something crazy? There is a butt ton of these videos of people like standing out in a field and they're like, they're live streaming while they're like, there's something behind me. Watch this. And you'll see this little yeah. thing pop up and pop back. Right. So it, this, this is said to be their, their natural habitat. That looks very unpleasant unless we're talking like in, in the mountains. Because to live, coming back. Because to I live, think they're making this again. Because something is going to shift. Something like we got talking to on the Ragnarok podcast. Something is changing. Yeah, there are big changes in the air. There are corporations that are basing their entire business model around countries converting from capitalism to a communist socialist structure. That they have all this infrastructure set into place so that once that happens they have all these institutions and partner groups oh. that are going to start profiting from it in an insane way like so, ride sharing sort of we have cash <laughs> shortages farms for um protein for beans that's like three times more efficient than soy takes three times less fertilizer i mean there are people that even, are poised even in this article it mentions that um like, uh, apparently, uh, sometimes they will build tiny houses above the ground, mm -hmm. uh, which the tribes have always known to leave well enough alone. Now, just does like, that remind you of anything, Stein? Yeah, you just mentioned that at the beginning. In Holland and Denmark, 
do they still not build little houses sometimes for the others? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we do. Um, and sometimes, you know, even if it's just, I don't know, like maybe meant as a, as a joke, I, I remember, um, I haven't been there in a while, but a park, um, well, park, city park, as far as you can call it a park here in, uh, in Leiden, in my hometown near the, near the city center, there are, well, there are uh, a couple of big trees there um, and they have like placed or, or built or created something that looks like a well, like a home like a the, the the front door front porch of a of a home in the tree or against the tree as to say if there are little people here if there are uh, dwarves don't they if they are here you know we got a home for you we you know we made it pretty we made it nice just yes. watch you know. out for our house and we'll provide you one you know yeah and, in, and, in, and Euro I, in european lore that's that's still still a big thing not unfortunately not as much in the in the cities but um yeah kabouters uh we call them so uh or tonte, tonte is uh the uh the old name um we they are really popular here like we have books about them i know my parents had a book about them i um i believe they don't have it anymore unfortunately because it's always been one of my favorite books and actually you know as a kid i just I, I liked seeing the pictures and whatever you know uh one of those uh dwarves although i believe they are different from kabouters I'm not sure um one of the tomtes let's say um being like just the size of a bird no like you know like a, a, a small a... a small bird and um their mortal enemy is said to be trolls like actual Look up the kobold oh yeah love those well i mean not really but pedro the mummy that's all i'm gonna say look up the kobold Aren't they said to be like really ugly? They're sprites stemming from German mythology. Oh, this is all. Eh, this is all CG, CGI. Um, let's see if I can find like an old fairy tale book interpretation of one. Keely, baby, you really need you because I can't keep. Right. Doing, I can't keep doing this. <laughs> I have a podcast. You're doing tomorrow. great, brother. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. First time I'm actually trying to... Um, okay. I have my VPN on anyway, so let's try and use Google. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, of course. Okay, this is... Uh, this is like an artistic... Uh, kobolds in ancient lore. That might be a good way to find an interpretation of one an evil kind of uh, about or or ah interesting okay um i found a article on wikipedia it's in dutch so i'm able to easily understand it awesome now Luckily pedro mommy dude i'm just saying little flat face long nose but go ahead please read on in dutch i'd, I'd love to hear this uh let's see um let's see if i can bring back pedro the um, pedro the mummy so we have some comparison oh there are a lot of pictures oh actually with x-ray skeletal structure interesting mm -hmm. his sacral suture is fully healed he was an adult man Okay, so let's see. Atlas Obscura. Okay, so this is Pedro. And then close this. Is this? That's the Smithsonian again. Damn it. This is. Okay, hold up. Um, yeah, that's about the giants. We already did that. <laughs> yeah. 
So this there it is, is this is there it is artistic in interpretation of a cobalt, and then this is Pedro. I can, yeah, and there are some, saying, there I, are some I similarities. Think, <laughs> I think Pedro is proof enough that the lore comes from somewhere, though. That it's not just an out of the air fairy tale. You know what I mean? They are uh, also common in German and Scandinavian folk tales. Yeah. So they are often represented of the counter opposite of elves and nymphs. So they are like everything everything dark they are thieves they they guide the dead huh that's interesting El they yeah. use elfin fruit to lure people to nah. their death i've heard i've heard that they lure people off and lure them to their death and that they're they are deviant little tricksters right Kind of like the opposite of a brownie. Like a brownie is a loving trickster, right? You know, you leave them fruit and they'll do your work for you. You know what I mean? Like without your permission, of course, but they're, they're doing it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like these guys were the opposite. They were gremlins, the, the ones on the aircraft wing, tearing it apart while you're flying in the air. You know, the kobold was where the, the tail of the gremlins came from, right? Ah, now, so there's there are even... I've heard about this, but more, um, sometimes they will switch um, human babies with a cobalt baby. I've heard that story before, but with, um, with the fae. Changelings. Yeah. Cha oh, are. let's see. A, a follet is, uh, is a sort of a cobalt, but uh, like with the same magical powers and magical gifts as the fae as fairies mm -hmm. change they're, they're just a little dark now bring up brownies uh, okay let's... there's there uh... you get like the same interpretation but they're the friendly version brownies mythology. yeah i'll just do mythology otherwise i'm gonna get that works, that works too. yeah oh they're Celtic, Scottish Gaelic. Ah, oh, interesting. Oh, there are definitely some kind of kobold or tomte. Ah, oh, wow. That is right. And they're now, sha they're shapeshifters. Sometimes they appear in sh in the shapes of animals. Of the yeah. Now I want you to. Think I was watching the show on um on like cryptozoology and odd creatures and stuff the other day. Anytime people have claimed to have run across any one of these things, they huh. claim that before they did, they got this deep foreboding, almost like a vibration of fear. Right? Dude. Like they got confused, scared all at one time. And then they see this thing and they just take off. Right, so Dude. they have some kind of ability to mess with us. You know what yeah, I mean? does this sound familiar? Thinking more in the along the lines of pop culture, if the family gives the brownie a gift of clothing, he will leave forever and refuse to work for the family. Now, what does that remind you of? Thinking more pop culture, I'm thinking Dobby from the Harry Potter series. Mm hmm now that look you've seen the the they made him but look more like the um dobby's a cobalt yeah i was gonna i was gonna say that yeah but i mean a lot of that uh gandalf i mean gandalf literally means magic elf and is um is inspired too by um, by Odin, among mm -hmm. among others, of course. Have you ever watched that movie again from the very beginning, the very first one, 
when he walks up to Frodo's door, he carves a rune in his door. It's like the oh. Fehu, I think. Oh no, I should I should look that up. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do it now uh on the on the podcast. I don't wanna don't want this to get but, copyright hey, claims. It's hobbits, man. It's hobbits, it's related. They live in well, burrows. Yeah. Hey, come on. Same podcast. It's related. We can look it up. What rune did Odin carve in Frodo's door? Gandalf. <laughs> yeah, Gandalf. That <laughs> magic elf. What rune did Gandalf carve in Bilbo? It was Bilbo. Was it Bilbo? Bilbo. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 let's see. Carved a. I think it was a, a B who ran. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, um, gonna share the screen again. Sorry, people, we're doing this a lot, but you know, now that we know how to, how to work it, it's gonna happen more. Let's see. Put us over there so we can actually see. Was um, it no, Feo. Okay, it was Feo. Old, old Anglo-Saxon makes sense. Yeah, I guess that's a, an accurate way of describing it. Even though that rune's been exactly the same since it was Teutonic in the German. Oh, so later in the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien uses, I'm going to call it Surth, Kurth, an invented alphabet based on Futhark and Futhark. Now, the cool thing about this is, this is at a time where Christianity said, if you were pagan, you were evil. Right. Tolkien wrote these books a long time ago when it was still frowned upon to look at anything that was outside of Christianity. Right. Yeah. But he had to find a way to bury the lore so that people could still see pieces of it and hear the names of old and still recognize it in modern day. He, he kept bits and pieces of it alive in that story. Now, Think about this. In the time Tolkien was writing that, there uh, wasn't wait, massive I have, copies I of have stories at us. A very, very clear depiction. This is, I am guessing this is from the, the movie itself. Uh, okay, let's see. That is, that is Feo. Indeed. This part, this is like, this is the, the door. Um, this is what he carved in there. That's Feo. Yeah. Now, can you see the Dagaz rune? Yeah. I was watching Hellboy the other day. And I mean, there's a bunch of different bits in it. Watch the new Hellboy movie and there's bits and pieces of like Odinic lore in it, right? Yeah. And when he comes back across to Arthur, or no, not Arthur, um, Merlin. Merlin mm. goes to pull the sword up out of the water and he carves a Dagaz rune on the shoreline. And the sword comes up out of the water, almost like it was like a, a key to a door. You'll, it was, uh, you'll see that in the, um, or you'll read that in the Arthurian legends, but it was uh, the Lady of the Lake actually holding the, the sword up. Yeah. Oh, I mean, this is Hellboy. Yeah, it's it's Hollywood, some creative license. Which, by the way, uh, I'm sorry, but taking Ron Perlman out of that role butchered the movie. That was well, not okay. They Why took did they do that? Yeah. Oh, they, you didn't notice that the last Hellboy did not look the same at all? I have seen Hellboy 1 and 2. Um, I'm, I didn't even know there was, oh, there was another, there's there's another, another part. Yeah. 
Yes. There's another one, and he has to get King Arthur's sort of long story. I'm not going to ruin it for you. <laughs> no, that's different fine. Time, but, different time, different podcast, different. But, but yeah, even even in the, the Hellboy movies, there are so many mythological creatures, and there, very, there are very small creatures, too, indeed. And they are, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've seen the movies, but they were quite the nuisance. Now... The first Hellboy movie, I think, had a very strong storyline for this very reason. If you strip all the Hellboy stuff away and just look at the main storyline, humans and Fae got into a battle, yeah. right? And the Fae retreated. They, they formed some kind of pact with the humans. A human betrayed them, and they retreated into the woods, right? They hid themselves. Now, I think mm. that very much speaks to reality <laughs> you know like i think that's what's happened we've the the church has waged a war on any old knowledge and they've tried to erase it from history but we have struggled and strived to keep little bits and pieces of it together and when most, we run across the, like the haven or room stone, yeah and and a lot of them in the form of um of fairy tales of children's stories i mean we may call them fairy tales we may call them children's stories but um i i do believe and uh we have gone into this in other podcasts as well um i believe i talked about this with raven on the uh the dungeon dragons and tabletop role-playing uh podcasts uh i remember asking something along the lines of would um would those games also be a way of um, preserving our history, preserving our culture, preserving our heritage as we have done with uh, with fairy tales, with the kids' stories, you know, take the Brothers Grimm, for example. Wow. I mean, their, their stories were indeed grim. I mean, it's, you know, it's Europe in, um, I want to say like 17. Yeah. Yeah, they're t- and- they took the tales from the Dark Ages and just elaborated them over the next couple hundred years. And man, the, the original Grim Fairy Tales were grim. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. Just, I mean, that's you know, Germans they don't mess around. <laughs> no man, no man. Uh, give it to them raw. You know what I'm saying? That's it. If they want to, they want to dress dress it up and lace it and whatever, you know, make it a pretty little story, then fine, so be it. But they they did put it out there raw. Um, the, those those were uh, the older fairy tales, dude. Even the old Smurfs, the Shrumps, the original. Yeah. Oh, they they, they are that. they are huge here in uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands. They are so incredibly well, I mean, incredibly popular a lot of a lot of stereotypes i must say though a lot of stereotypes especially looking at uh at gargamel the bad guy that's a stereotype and a half there i'm, I'm <laughs> just saying that you do kind of look like johan all grown up and i'm just gonna leave that there but um you know it is what it is <laughs> <laughs> no but no that's that's i think that's interesting you um and that might also be um i think it works both ways actually you know it's it's a way to um preserve our heritage and well hide it uh it from the church you know that if if they if they see the books if they read the stories you can say oh but you know they're just they're just children's stories they're just bedtime stories nothing going on here but I think that uh, later, especially um, well, especially after 1776, uh, if you know anything about European American history, you know that's a big year, especially with all that's going on in uh, Germany, Bavaria, to be exact. Um, I think that hey. has also become a way of... Um, just as we, you know, as um, as we mentioned with the uh, with the hunter, 
you know, finding those people. Oh, you've you've been reading too many, you've been reading too many fairy tales. You've been watching too many, you know, too many kids movies. Um, I think that's that's become a big part of it now, unfortunately. To if people bring up that they, you know, they saw a something. yeah experienced it or or saw it or like felt felt it that you know we just like uh dude they're they're kids stories like you're a grown man come on you you don't actually believe that do you and then well I, stein i remember telling my mom when i was like six years old we were at our old house and this was an old stone house the landlords were you know people that literally had the house built and grew up there so it's not like it was a multiple owner home Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like these people lived in it and then they rented it to us when they, you know, got a different house somewhere else. So like I'm laying in my bed one night and I swear to you, dude, it's like middle of the night. I couldn't sleep. I've always had insomnia problems ever since I was a little kid. And I'm looking out my bedroom door into the dining room and I see this thing that's like maybe a, a foot and a half tall, kind of chubby, peek out around the corner. And he walks out into the middle of the floor and another one looks around and walks out and they're doing stuff. They're interacting with each other. And I'm like freaking out. I'm hiding. I'm like just my eyes sticking out of the blanket. Right. Oh, yeah. I'm like, on my bed. Oh. <laughs> the nightlight in the kitchen illuminated enough of the living room floor that I could see these things like they look like two cats fighting, but like people. Right. And huh. it was the craziest thing I, I remember telling my mom the next day I, I saw gremlins in the house and she's like that's not real da, 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 da. and I tried to tell her they, they looked like the things from gummy bears you know little leather armor and everything but little wow. they looked like the ogres, gummy bears but little and they were fighting each other in our living room and she's like that's your imagination and all this I saw those things over and over and over again dude that was just the first time. And like, I can't imagine if I saw something like that as an adult, dude, I think it would just snap my brain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, we've been so desensitized and tuned away to think that it's just lore. It, that's all it is. It's just if somebody stories. ran across like that. Now they just, you know, instant, like a black pill breaking of their brain yeah it's frightening i mean like there's there's so much lore leprechauns i mean come on dude yeah like that we haven't even touched on them tonight right and you look at so many cultures know what a leprechaun is they like, are they are a staple in in irish culture yes and vita culture also the indians man the they they have tales of little people in their culture, right? Every oh, culture has it. They have a group of gods that we talked about before. Hanuman, mm -hmm. right? Hanuman had a group of brothers, right? And I can't remember which one it is, but one of them had the name like Dagas or Dagalas or Manas. It was one of the runes was his name. Manas, Manas maybe. I, I can't remember, but um, I was looking at that and I was like, that is just like so ironically tied together that it is unreal. Like they, they're worshiping a God that we also call a God and have given a rune name to and everything. Like it was, it, it, it snapped my mind in that moment. Like I had one of those brain farts. Um, I'll I'll try to find that one and send it to you. We'll discuss it on a later podcast and the other sinks between Vedic and Germanic and Norse. Because that is insane. Yeah, it's it's all it's all Indo Indo-European, of course. So yeah, like you like, think there's a lot of ties with Christianity and, and Norse paganism, and there is, there's a lot. Oh but man, sure. stuff, it's like gods of the same name and everything. You know, it's nuts. Yeah, but uh, like I do think, um, I mean, the the, the basics uh, of what we're what we're told by people who will actually 
research it and actually know what they're talking about. Um, main one in our circles is uh, Survive the Jive. Love his research, absolutely. But that um, at a certain point, there was a, a split, you know, um, people, like a group of people, one going, uh, one going west into Europe, which eventually became, um, you know, the the Germanic tribes, the Frankish tribes, and then uh, one going east um, into into India, you know, the ancient the ancient Aryans, and uh, yeah, they the brought migration they, was a they big br- thing. and they brought their their religion and their texts uh, with them, and uh, eventually in the east that became. Uh, I think among others, um, Hinduism and Buddhism. Like I know Hinduism, Buddhism, they are, uh, they are not the same religion, but um, they both definitely they are. They overlaps. both, they both definitely are Aryan religions, and mm-hmm. like same. Same here in Europe, as we, uh, you know, as we talked about on the uh, the giants podcast i don't know if if it was the first one or the the second one yes people we did too this dude has way too much information is way too good of a researcher it's always it's always multiple parts um about the first first one i mean that's we're gonna do either oh yeah man but the um the pantheons you know the the greek pantheon the slavic the norse the germanic um, it's all similar. The stories are really similar, so they definitely have the same root. And as you mentioned, um, similar stories, similar gods, sometimes even with the same same names or names that come from the same root in you know the Eastern religions, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, and same with the with the lore with the. Um, you know the giants, the little people. You know if if we have them in, you know if we have the stories in America, I mean, yeah, of course, some of it will be uh, will have been brought over from Europe. Not taking anything away from the Amer- from America and the Americans, um, etc. But even before the Europeans came there, if the native Americans, if the native tribes already had their stories. There were little people there. There were, you know, the well, what we know now as the Moonite people and the Ant people, we have them in Europe. Our our history and our lore is filled with stories. I mean, we just we looked up a couple, and that was just, you know, Dutch, Dutch Germanic, um Scottish, you know, that's just more. Northern, yeah, no, that's country. more northern yeah, Europe. I don't, I don't even yeah. know what they have in the more we Mediterranean part. The Celtic and Irish, we like literally. I mean, there's so much little people lore in Ireland and Scotland. Yeah. It is unreal, man. The fairies, the sprites, the fae, the brownies. They they have tales of all of it. The fae overlap there, and like, uh, it's, and I don't even know what stories they. Uh, may or may not have in the more in the more southern part of Europe in the the Mediterranean Mediterranean, you know, uh, Portugal, Spain, well, Italy. Um, you know, I don't even know the stories there. I mean, I'm Northern European, so I was you know brought up with the, the stories that we tell here in in the Northern Europe, mostly the uh, you know from the brothers uh, brothers Grimm and the Smurfs, indeed. So, like, if it's oh. if it's worldwide, if we have those those stories, those those people in sightings and burial mounds with seventy five thousand <laughs> skeletons, right? And there, I mean, there is there is something there is something to it. It it either there is like as with the uh, the religions and language and all of that, there is one common root that has slowly but surely spread over the world and became you know the languages that we have now and the religions that we know now or now, there's you know, an they, upturn in the sightings were worldwide things. oh really 
Yeah, you, yes. You mentioned Dude, that. Look but... online. This is no joke. There, um, there, I was looking at it the other day, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the hashtags for certain things, the trending topics and hashtags, mm. you can go into TikTok and it was like little people or little beings um, following me and things like that where like people are doing videos and they're walking through the woods and all of a sudden they notice something behind them on their screen is like popping out and looking at them. And yeah, they're like just looking I, at this like beautiful vista trying to do a video and they accidentally catch this little thing. I have seen whole... I have seen videos of that as well. I can I, I can remember clearly um to bikers, to dirt to like people on a dirt bike, you know, going over the yes. dirt roads Flying and a trail with a GoPro. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, oh long live GoPros, long live technology when it comes to those right. kind of things you know it's it's a blessing and a curse um but just something really small like shooting from the uh like out of the grass over the road and they i believe they tried to um well to to chase it to find it but it's it disappeared and it was really really small indeed could have been no yeah, like no taller than than a foot, foot and a half. I seen one the other day, and it was a whole bunch of videos. They put a compilation together of all of these like videos that are popping up, and uh, they did a really good version of it. It was on YouTube, I think. Um, but it it started out with these kids at a birthday party, and they're sitting there. I mean, they got party hats on and stuff. Like you could tell that they're jovially celebrating and then all of a sudden one of them starts screaming and this thing runs from a doorway through the back side of the room maybe a foot and a half tall looked like a little person hauled ass through the house scared the kids to death like that reaction was not <laughs> was yeah. not faked you know what i mean and but it, it followed that into like eight or nine other videos where people are like sitting there at a party or doing something and something just startles the hell out of them. And it's one of those things. And a lot of them were in um, the Western side of the United States and in Northern Mexico. There's mm. been like a bunch of them like upticking in that area, right? Yeah, people, man. I'm telling yeah. you, you have something big that's about to turn around and all of these things are starting to tick back up again. I mean, we are... Indeed, it's coming to uh, to the end of a cycle. Um, if you, for our listeners and our viewers, if you want to know more about that, listen to our Wreck and Rock podcast, um, or you know, watch sure. our watch our Wreck and Rock podcast. By the way, real real quick, <laughs> I've had so many questions about that. Like, whoa, like you're recording another podcast? Did did I miss part two? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Still have to record part two. Don't worry, you didn't miss anything. It's, it's dude, it's getting to come. It's getting traction. It's insane, and it's it's really. Subscribe, man. Oh yeah, like if if you want to stay up to date, subscribe. Especially on Ragnarok and the end of the cycle, like we we have we had great people come on, and you know I'm I'm, I'm wait to get Raven in one of those conversations, man. Oh man, like for part two, he he has to work as well. Like I mean, I think for part three, just check with check with Raven first, then everybody well, else. Like we we can we can't do a rock and rock podcast without Raven. Come on. I know. I I felt bad. I wanted him there for the first one, man. I really did. Yeah, I think he would have contributed a lot of that. Oh yeah. Anyways, um. Stein, I'm losing one of my lights, brother, and we're about an hour and 40 minutes in here. I, uh, I'm i taking it as that's my sign, dude. I need to go get some food. You know? Oh, hour and 40 minutes. That's that's short. It's pretty short for, like, for, for, for our standards. You know, thinking of Giants, we went to, to two hour but, plus. Uh, I think I'm also uh, starting to swell up again. Oh, uh, yeah, with your your tooth and yeah. All. yeah yeah impact yeah okay oh, well guess uh guess we'll wrap it up here um next time yes. next we time i want to part two on this 
Oh yeah. I want Rachel and Raven. I, I really want Raven in the in the little people part too because I know he's got a lot of input. He, listen, just his knowledge of D and D, and the reference to a lot of the different little fake when, creatures when that I are looked, used in the game. It, when I looked up Kobold, he has so, a lot of so stuff that reference. I got was D and D. But that yeah. it all came from somewhere before D and D was put together. Oh yeah, and I think I think Dungeons and Dragons, like they are it is also a way or just you know tabletop role playing. It is a way of um of preserving our uh, our stories. Those were and really good. And yeah. Those were really good podcasts gets, too with Raven. Those were really good. That that gets me like I the uh the satanic panic that happened around the whole D and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. People are learning people are learning something other than Christianity that they can enjoy, they can learn about, they can dedicate their time to, and it upset the church. Yeah, so too, the satanic. Too party. bad, too bad you missed the life. It was it was pretty good. I mean, he's he's gonna do it. Um, that's gonna be his thing. Tea time with Raven. Um, I'll, I'll, I know I'll I meant, to, the, uh, I meant to be in that one. I totally thought that was six p.m. <laughs> no, no, no. It's 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 a shame. I was I was at work, so I caught a uh, I could catch a little of it. It was uh, it was still relatively quiet at work, so I was uh, I was lucky enough to catch a bit of it. Um, I'll put that in the show notes as well for uh, all our listeners and our viewers. Um, our well beloved and well-respected member Raven is starting his own thing as well. Um, Josh, I, I believe you are one of few, at least of the um, the admins, let's say, let's call it the um, the tribe of the Gray Horn, the, the tribe of the Gray Horn Pagans, more inner, inner circle. I guess you're one of few who don't really have your own thing although you're a, a regular guest here because man you're you're I a good keep, you're such a good researcher I keep, I keep my things in the tribe i want to bring people to the tribe man yeah I, and I, that's you know, that's I, really that's I, really appreciated I, I, them, I want i want to bring the people to the tribe so i put all of my content there i put all of my quotes there and a lot of nonsense out of my head there too no, it's, it's not, not it's, all, it's not necessarily, you know. it's not necessarily nonsense. You know, it's what popped up in your head. It's what you think is relevant. And many things are, are relevant and, you know, things that have happened to our, our ancestors as well. So in, in a different Look way, the, in a different way, perhaps the moral still. Decline. The moral decline in society is pointing towards Ragnarok. Go yeah. watch that one. Yeah. And and, and uh, brace yourself for part two that should be coming on the 29th of August it's on a Monday uh, I hope to have it up and edit it and everything by uh, Tuesday Mondays and Tuesdays are my uh, my days off it's my weekend so that's when I get to uh, get to do everything um, so yeah Dude, thanks. And uh, next time, we next time we we really have to. Uh, next time, I want to get into the more uh, more British things. You know, the more the more Gaelic uh, with the the leprechauns and the oh yeah uh, and and the bra- and the brownies. Oh, taking the Gaelic. Oh man, there's yeah. a lot of little people lore there. I I couldn't unpack all of that in today too. I, I couldn't. It no, would have just. No. I, I want here to, for four hours. I really would love to uh, to make that part two because th- there is so much good lore to be found there as well, and so many. Oh yeah. Good stories, oh. and you know, as we said, like the leprechaun, it's like leprechauns and Ireland. Those two are. Man, if you say Ireland, you say le- you say leprechauns. If you say leprechauns, you say Ireland. Ireland, like, you know, especially in our modern culture, le- leprechauns and Ireland are synonymous. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's their mascot. It's on everything you see. Irish has got a leprechaun on it. The fight in Irish, Lucky Charms. It's all there. <laughs> hey. Yeah, yeah. 
we've got to bring this back to our culture. You know, we've got to bring some old ways back to the new ways, man. We've got to, got to connect back with our gods again. See the stars, dude. You know, filter out some of that. Filter out some of that. Uh, what do you call it? That light pollution. That mm. radio interference. Get out in the woods. Look up at the sky. Touch some connect. grass. <laughs> For real. Yeah. Anyways, I, uh, I'm child of Ash 420 everywhere except for in the tribe of the great horn pagans i'm joshua thane of the tribe um child of ash 420 on uh mines child of ash 420 on twitter child of ash 420 just about everywhere else uh joshua 14 e on rumble but you'll find me in the tribe more than anywhere else yeah and he uh... our telegram channel man telegram channel mines channel yeah and you you uh you're posting some interesting stuff there and just, you know, I like leading up to our podcast with little snippets. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you want to be prepared for the, uh, for the next podcast, uh, I was hoping to do this, uh, to do this live. Unfortunately, uh, technology did not want to work with me. Uh, so maybe next time we'll find a different way of, um, of doing it live. So uh, for now, thank you all for being here once again. Thank you, Josh, for all the diving and digging you have done. And uh, I, can't, I can't wait for, uh, for part two. That's going to be really interesting. Tribe of the Greyhound Pagans. Yeah, man. Tribe of the Greyhound Pagans. You can find us on telegram t.me forward slash greyhorn pagans you can find us on mines just look up greyhorn pagans uh those are the two main channels that we're on we are also of course on odyssey where you will find the full video versions of our podcast uh, i will leave all the links in the description in the uh, in the show notes we uh, and if you're lazy, you know, Linktree, I'll leave that up to every, everything's in there. That link uh, is handy. How did you get our uh, Patreon up on Linktree? Uh, oh, that is a good one. I believe I still have to add that. Um, yeah. Thanks, Josh, for, uh, for reminding me. I should plug that as well. We do have a Patreon up and running for the Greyhorn Pagans podcast. Um, we have a couple of different tiers from um, just having your name in the end credits all the way to having uh, early access to the uh, to the podcast. So if you want to support us, support the tribe, support the work that we do, um, help us do more research, deeper research. Unfortunately, some things are hidden behind a paywall so if you want to help us if you think all oh, this is is awesome it's really interesting go to patreon.com forward slash greyhorn gotta get better somehow exactly so if you want to help us go to patreon.com forward slash greyhorn pagans pick out a tier doesn't matter which one everything is helpful if you don't like Patreon with all that they have done for uh, or done to, I should say, uh, creators, we are also yeah. on Ko-Fi. So, you know, just buy us a coffee. Can be a one-time donation. Can be a monthly structural donation. Uh, Ko-Fi slash Greyhorn Pagans. I will put everything up in show notes, of course. Um, I am Stan Fox, the Jarl. You can find me at t.me forward slash Stein Fox, I am on Twitter um, at Stein Fox. Minds, same thing, Stein Fox. Um, Odyssey, YouTube, just wherever. If you look up Stein Fox, you'll find me. So, Josh, thank you. And thanks to all our blast, and thanks to all our listeners and viewers for once again being here. It was a Pleasure. A bit shorter than uh, than we're used to with you, but um, you have some issues, unfortunately. So uh, take care. Problem. Yeah. So take care of that first, and 
we will uh, yes, sir. see you soon for part two. Thank you. And until next time, see ya.